Hello and welcome to another video. In this one, we're going to be talking about Git, and we're going to be talking about a fairly advanced bit of Git, which is how it actually works under the hood. Uh, so let's jump into it. Okay, so Git is a little bit magical. Uh, I'm going to clone a Git repository and sort of use it as an example here to show you all of the little things that are going on underneath it. Uh, we're going to be using the AST Pretty repository. You'll notice that when you deal with a git repository, you have this git directory, this dot git directory. It's a hidden directory by default, and it has a whole bunch of stuff in it. And usually you don't need to look at any of this and understand anything that's going on. We're going to be looking a little bit into what objects are today and how git actually produces commits and files and how all of that stuff fits together. I recently figured this out to do some uh, low-level investigation into how git diff applies when dealing with conflicts and smudge filters other stuff that i probably will cover in other videos uh, but it's not really important today if you look inside this git objects directory you'll see that there is this info and pack directory we're actually not going to go into the details of this pack directory this is the actual implementation of the git database and not the sort of higher low level <laughs> explanation of how it works uh, this is sort of an optimization that's come along from years of Git being you know, popular and needing to optimize this case, the original version of Git didn't have this pack stuff. It was a little bit different. Or it did have the pack, but it wasn't, it was a little bit more transparent on how it worked. Uh, the original Git was more just a file system management stuff, and it turned more into a version control system over time. Um, but anyway, let's talk about objects in Git, and that's how Git represents literally everything, which is kind of the, the the hook on this video, which is that Git is just a fancy key value store. And the keys to all of its objects are SHA-1s of the contents of the objects, basically building a content, content addressable storage system. Now there are three types of objects inside of Git. There are blobs, well, there are more than this, but today we're only gonna talk about three of them. There are blobs, which is what Git uses to represent a file. So if we do, uh, we're gonna be using this Git cat file uh, function a lot. In fact, we're going to use git cat file dash p, and this allows you to show the contents of a git object. And so we're going to look at, for instance, setup.py. Uh, this is not exactly the object ID, but it's an easy way to get to that object. Um, and you'll see that git has stored a file which has this contents. We can actually find the ID of that file by doing rev parse. And this is a special syntax that's at the head revision, I want the tree object that has this name. Uh, and so you can see this is the ID of that object. And again, if we do git cat file dash p, that gives us our object. So this is kind of the lowest level primitive, which is a blob. Uh, I'm actually gonna use a little paint diagram to, to show our three types here, which are blobs, trees, and commits. And the first of those is our blob which is just an OID, an object ID. Git internally refers to these as OIDs in the C source, and this maps to the file contents. Um, and we can actually get back that object ID by hashing this output here. So if we do, I think it's hash object dash W. Yeah. Um, so this allows us to get the SHA-1 hash of this object. I believe it's slightly different than that. Yeah, there's some other metadata inside here that changes how it actually hashes. I don't remember the specifics of it, um, but there's there's some slight other bit of data in here, which is why the SHA-1 doesn't match here. But uh, internally, it uses SHA-1. Uh, this is a 160-bit hash, 20 bytes of hash, uh, and that'll, that'll be important later. Remember that. Okay, so that's the first type of object, which is just blobs, uh, which is an object ID that maps to the file contents. The second is a tree object. A tree represents a directory in Git. Now, Git doesn't actually store directories. You can't just, you know, make dir foo and git add foo. That doesn't make any sense. There's no, you know, you can't store an empty directory in Git. However, Git stores its graph of blob objects as a tree, and a tree can contain other trees. And uh, if we git cat file, for instance, the root tree, which you can either do slash or, or just a colon. Uh, oops, cat file dash p, right, right, right. 
you'll see that there is a tree object here and a tree refers to other blobs by their object ID. So you can see like this is the git ignore object. If we were to show this object here, git cat, file dash p this, you can see this is the contents of the git ignore that's referred to as a blob with this ID and this mode bit. One, one zero zero means that it's a normal file and 644, uh, git technically doesn't let you store anything but 644 and 755, um, but this is the sort of Unix file mode, meaning that it's read write for the current user and readable by everyone else. If we had stored an executable file, like if we did chmod plus x, now I would never do this, but, uh, and then git add setup.py git write tree. And then if we do git cat file dash p this, you should see, yeah, you'll, you'll see that this now has a different mode here. It still has the same blob as it had before because the contents didn't change, only the mode changed here. You'll note also here that trees can refer to other trees, and we can show this tree directly. Um, git cat file dash p this. So this is what the test directory looks like. And so a tree is kind of a recursive structure here. It can refer to other blobs, and it can refer to other trees. So let's add a tree here. Uh, a tree is an object ID that maps to uh, a bunch of blobs, trees, etc., and it is recursive. Um, it also includes the mode bits and the types, includes the mode and the type of its objects. And uh, I'll put a little box around these so that it's easier to understand that these are separate. Um, and it's recursive. So you kind of have, for, for a tree, you kind of have it referencing a bunch of other objects. Uh, yeah, I wish it were easier to draw arrows. Oh, I guess we can use this. <laughs> It's kind of bad. Um, it can reference other blobs. It can also reference other trees, which then reference other blobs. So you kind of get this recursive structure here. Uh, and that's kind of how your tree objects work. Uh, another blob here, for instance. Uh, the way this is actually stored behind the scenes looks a little bit different than this. This is actually the pretty printed output of this. You can get the real output by doing batch and then piping in the input. Uh, this batch is meant to be used as like a, a way to parse a bunch of these at once because starting and stopping a subprocess is expensive. Um, this is the actual way that they're represented behind the scenes. Uh, now there's a little bit of magic going on here. This is the output from batch, so this isn't actually the tree object. This is the tree object here. And the format of this is uh, six ASCII characters that are the mode, then a space, then the file name, uh, then I believe there is a null byte here, but we can't see the null byte because it's printed to the terminal. Then there are 20 bytes here, and those 20 bytes are the, I said this earlier, the, those are the SHA-1 value here, so 160 bits. Uh, they're just the raw bytes. You can convert them to the ASCII representation of the hash by pulling in the bytes and then you know writing them out uh, using hex or whatever. Uh, then I believe there's another null byte here, and then you get another line here. And so it, it sort of repeats that over and over. Um, and so you can see there are two objects in here. The first is the init.py object, and the second is this asdpretytest.py object. Um, and this hash refers to the raw bytes that are here, and this hash refers to these raw bytes here. So it's not quite it's not quite as nice to read in the actual implementation details, but that's that's how it works. All right, so that's two of the three objects. The last object is a commit object. Uh, and in order to get a commit, we're just gonna look at rev parse head. That's actually probably not, well, that'll do fine. Uh, let's get, actually, let's get a commit that's not a merge commit that way. Yeah, and not a signed commit. <laughs> uh, find my last commit here. Yeah, this one will do. I'm, I'm skipping merged commits and signed commits because their output is a lot harder to read and understand, but you could look at those in your own time. Uh, if we do get cat file dash p on this commit object, you'll see that a commit object contains a whole bunch of metadata. Uh, it has the tree. This is again a reference to the tree of that, uh, you know, the, the entire Git repository at that time. So if we do git cat file dash p this, you'll see this is you know, the blobs and trees at that point in time. It also refers to the parent commit. 
There may be multiple parents here, which is why I didn't want to show merge commits. I'll show you a merge commit in a second. A merge commit will actually have two parents here, and you can have many parents. Uh, there, there's a thing called octo merge, which is where lots of things get merged into one. Uh, it's not always eight things, but I don't quite know why it's called octo merge. Anyway, uh, there's also two other pieces of metadata here, which is the author of the commit and the committer of the commit. Uh, this is sort of uh, mutable data. Well, I guess they're technically both mutable, um, but they're meant to be separate. So you could say like, you know, somebody emailed me a patch, they're the author of it. I committed their patch, I'm the committer of this. And then finally, after all of this sort of header data, there's the commit message at the bottom. Uh, if it's a signed commit, which actually get rev parse head, this will be a signed and uh, merge commit, so we'll actually see both of those things at the same time. Git cat file dash p this. Yeah. <clears throat> and it doesn't end in a new line, which is fun. Uh, but you'll actually see a little bit different output here. You'll see we have two parents here. This is because it's a merge commit. It takes two parts of source and merges them together. Uh, you'll see that we have a GPG signature here. This is how Git stores the, the signing of a commit. And then we have you know, the norm, normal commit message at the bottom, as, as usual. You'll see here that the committer and the author are different. Uh, GitHub committed this, because I clicked the button in the GitHub UI, uh, whereas I am the author of this commit. Actually, I'm surprised I'm the author. I would expect, yeah. I guess I authored the merge and GitHub committed it. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Anyway, so that's kind of our third object here that we're going to talk about today, which is our commit object. And a commit object references two things. Uh, one is the parents, uh, parent commits, maybe more. And it also references the root tree of whatever it's committing. Now you might have noticed something here. Uh, there's no idea of a patch inside Git, which is kind of the first like weird aha light bulb moment that I had while looking at this, which is that Git actually isn't a patch store. Uh, it is just a sort of representation of a tree. Uh, the the actual computation of a diff between one brand or between one object and another is you grab the tree from that object, you grab the tree from the other, or you grab the tree from that commit, you grab the tree from the other commit, and you figure out all the items that are different in it, and then generate the patch from that. So it doesn't actually store patches itself. Now this isn't entirely true. Uh, I talked a little bit about that pack file earlier and how I wasn't gonna go into the details there. Uh, but the pack file has some optimizations to not store you know, the entire content of the file over and over and over, and it instead stores uh, sort of an optimization of that, which is the most recent con uh, content and then kind of diffs based on that. That way it can compress nicely and not have to take so much network to actually do stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, we should also add another little arrow because it also has you know, the commit message, the author, et cetera, et cetera message, author, committer, signature, the other things that may show up in there. Uh, also the timestamps for all of that. So those are kind of the, the three objects that Git stores inside of its Git object database. There's also you know tags and such as well, but I'm not gonna go over those. Um, and at the, at the bottom of this, it's basically just a key value store. It's basically just SHA-1s that map to file contents. Now the file contents, Actually, I don't know what this one looks like. Let's let's run this one in batch mode just to see what it does. Git cat file batch at batch. Uh, oh, okay. It is just plain text. Okay. I thought it might have been a little bit more obfuscated because the tree was in a weird format, but it looks like this is just plain text. So it's pretty easy to pretty easy to parse and understand what's going on here. So you could figure out you could figure out the exact contents of this. And I bet if we were to take this and then do git dash object dash w uh, standard in, why did it not give us the result? Uh, let's just do this. Git hash object t. Did that give us the same commit ID? It didn't. Anyway, it should have given us the same commit ID. I bet there's like a white space difference or you know, some 
carriage return in here or it didn't end in a new line or something that made this slightly different. But in theory, you can take the blob that's in this commit and hash that with SHA-1 using whatever gets uh, hashing, because they do some other stuff to it, whatever their hashing algorithm is, and you should be able to get back exactly the same uh, commit ID that we had at the beginning. But anyway, that's low-level get, how it actually implements this, this wild key value blob store thing, how everything is really just you know, a pointer to another pointer to eventual bytes uh, in a sort of fancy key value store. Hopefully you found this useful. If there are additional things you would like me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platforms. But thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.